And actually, when we look at a business, all there really is, is a series of conversations that are happening in the organization. Hello, and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today, I have a very interesting conversation for you. We're going to be looking at one of my favorite leadership books called The Three Laws of Performance by Steve Saffron and Dave Logan. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. I think this book is one of the most phenomenal business books out there. I've read it many times. Um, I used to do a lot of um, personal development work with an organization called Landmark that was also um, a lot of the stuff that you read in here has its kind of coaching ontology or its coaching ideology or its coaching modality, if you like, which is, is very similar to the work of that personal development group, uh, Landmark. Um, and it's just an extraordinary book that's, you know, we have all of our clients of business of architecture read it. Um, we, we use it, we discuss it, we talk about it. The anecdotes and the stories in there are absolutely fantastic. Um, so get yourself a copy of this book and I'm going to talk about the actual three laws of performance in this podcast. Um, and you can, and start to actually how we look at them through the lens of an architecture practice and how we can use them. So let's start by, well, why on earth would you need a book like this in the first place? What are some of the issues and the problems that we see in architecture businesses facing in the first place? Well, number one is that architects tend to be very good in terms of performance when it comes to design, but very poor in performance when it comes to the actual business mechanics running and looking after managing the business, knowing where their profitability is on individual projects. Project management itself can get quite ropey at times. Um, we often see businesses, I mean, from my perspective, you know, Enoch and I, we've spoken about this a number, numerous times, but I do think the architecture profession as an industry is underperforming in its business needs. Um, and the reason why we can look at that is when we look at the finances of practices, when we look at the salaries of architects, um, and for the amount of liability and for the amount of work that it takes to become an architect and for the responsibility and the hours that get put in, it just feels like it's a real long slog. So in that sense, the, um, the, the business performance, I would assert, is underperforming. Not unusual that when I speak to architecture practices, they're dealing with things like um, enormous amount of overwhelm, of fatigue. We'll speak to practice owners sometimes and they're in their mid-60s and they've got nothing for retirement. Uh, they've been running an organization which has been on the bread line, which has been on the knife edge for an incredible amount of time. And now they're looking at making retirement plans. And, you know, it's pretty difficult. That's a very difficult situation to be in. Um, I used to hear, and we'd still have it sometimes, you know, I'll ask and ask an architect about what their retirement plan is. And they'll say something like, you know, well, I'm going to die at the drafting table. That might be a, a bit of a joke sometimes, but in many cases it's not. And I think this is actually quite a serious situation in the architecture industry where we've got businesses that don't come to any kind of powerful conclusion. They either just wither away or it's unlikely that, you know, it's, there's lots of businesses that never get sold or there's not a powerful succession plan that gets put into place. And that can be very heartbreaking for the owners involved. When we look at underperformance in terms of fulfillment as well, um, I know that there's lots of practices that are not doing the kind of design work that they want to be doing. Um, they're not in the sectors that they would like to be in. Um, perhaps they've got the chops, perhaps they've got the know-how, but by the way that the business has been organized and structured internally, this has been, and just the lack of profit in them, this has been a preventative issue for them actually 
getting into the position that they want to be into and win the work they want to be want to be winning. I, I think as well, one of these the kind of performance issues that we see in architecture is lots of practices end up becoming very satisfied or complacent, if you like, with mediocre results. And we can, Enoch and I, we've spoken about this a lot as well on previous podcasts, um, where we see people actually fight for the status quo of mediocrity. Um, and I think this is ridiculous. This is enough you know, architects, we are amazing people at being able to see the wider ranging impact of our profession. And we know how important it is. We're very quick as well to wave the banner for lots of activism, be it the climate crisis, to diversity, um, to all sorts of a, array of different issues that society is dealing with. However, as individual organizations with agency and i'm going to say that money is an index of agency we struggle in that sense we look at diversity in the profession one of the most unappealing um, kind of equations is the return on your investment of training for the best part of seven years investing tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars pounds into becoming an architect only for a very mediocre, if not poor, salary at the end of it. It's a huge investment for a for something which isn't delivering. And of course, that that equation makes it more difficult for people to get involved into the profession and to stay inside the profession. So the the business aspect of it feeds its way into all these other areas having the ability to have more impact in sustainability for example being able to to sell passive house services or sustainable services or be a driver um, of that kind of work again business knowledge and know-how will help us market these things it will help us identify how to position those kinds of sustainable services in the context of say a client's business agenda and their pain points and their needs um, and this is quite a complex thing that again business knowledge marketing and sales know-how will help us be able to become more powerful in our agency and delivering the kinds of high caliber design work that we want to be doing a successful profitable business has choice Okay, it has a choice where it directs its resources. It has a choice in where it directs its funds. It has a choice in the kinds of projects that it takes on. It has confidence. It has a natural ability to negotiate. It's not needy. It's not in scarcity. It's in, in abundance. And all of this creates a much more powerful and persuasive organization that is able to perform at a higher level, be that just financially uh, and in terms of profit or as well as in terms of design and being able to get and do the kinds of projects and have the kind of architectural impact that so many architects desire. So that's the, the, the kind of synopsis of a lot of problems that we see or why a book like this is incredibly powerful. Um, and what I want to kind of create as a possibility here for an organization is that we are operating in architectural practices that number one are profitable that there is a powerful exit strategy for the owners that has been thought about and is in place. Be that a powerful transition or succession plan where a new group of leaders is identified and they take over the business. Um, again, that's a kind of plan that might take between five and 10 years to do it really, really well. Um, and being able to think about high performance as an organization is critical in doing that. A business owner might want to sell the practice either to an outside third party, someone who's never had anything to do with the business before, um, create you know, lovely uh, retirement and lifestyle plans that the business is fulfilling on that. Uh, we might look at the possibility of an organization which is making money and doing impactful, fantastic design work, as well as having agency in all these other areas that architects are waving the banner of activism for repeatedly. So money, again, is the sort of index of agency here. 
Um, and it's, it's, we use it because it's, we're able to measure it and we're able to look at it and we're able to take a kind of snapshot of where a business is and what it's doing uh, at any given moment in time. So it becomes a very useful metric. It's not everything. And high performance as an organization isn't purely driven on profit-based goals and incentives. In fact, when we look at this book and we start talking about this book, the, the wider grander vision that you have for an organization and your ability to communicate it to others and have other people enrolled in that vision for the future is really what makes the high performance come about. So I'm going to talk about the three principles here. Spoiler alert. I'm going straight to the back, taking them out of the appendix. And there are the three laws of performance and their accompanying leadership corollaries. The first law of performance is how people perform correlates to how situations occur to them. Now, this is interesting. How people perform correlates to how situations occur to them. So we might think of this in terms of how an event, how circumstances are being perceived by us, how we're interpreting them, how we're building up an internal mental image of the reality that we're existing in right now, how that mechanism is happening. And we might use the word, the word language here is very important. Um, the word occurring. Okay. So that kind of projection of, of reality or how our brains and our minds are putting together all of our sensory um, input, if you like, and piecing it together and playing it back to us in terms of a edited, curated film. The way that that playback and experience is happening of all of our sensory input, that is what governs our performance. It governs our ability to take action and our ability to be, to complete things. Okay. I, I like to think of performance being personal power, um, your ability to be able to take action and accomplish a result that you've put your mind to or that you have said. Okay. So that's kind of like what we might look at in terms of well, what is high performance. Um, and this relationship between how an individual performs is related to the way that the world is actually occurring for somebody. There's an interesting book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I think it's called by Stephen Covey. It's one of these classic uh, personal development business books. And I believe it's this book. Um, at the very beginning of it, Stephen Covey, the author, writes a story of being on the New York Metro, uh, the subway system. And he talks about how a man and his three children come onto a carriage and the three children are behaving crazy. They're like screaming, shouting, they're like running around the carriage. And Stephen Covey, the author, he's looking at this and he's thinking in his, in his mind, well, why the hell are you not doing anything? Why the hell are you... Um, you know, not looking after your children. This is kind of crazy. And he could look around the carriage and lots of other people, lots of other passengers were also equally kind of perturbed by these unruly children. So Stephen being the sort of leader himself says, Hey, what, you know, what's, what's going on here with your kids? And the father of the children says, I'm so sorry. I, I'm, we're absolutely beside, I'm actually beside myself. Their mother just died. We were just coming back from the hospital. And of course, at that moment, the whole situation changes. And it's not the father's performance that changes. It's Stephen Covey, the author's ability to perform and to act and to respond completely transforms. Okay. So now he's opened his eyes up to being compassionate and understanding. And he immediately begins to, um, to help the kids and to kind of, you know, comfort the father and, and to listen and to be there. So what, what we see, the way that the situation suddenly changed and um, the way that the, the perception of the situation changed, the way that it's occurring changes, changed the author's ability to perform and the actions that they were choosing to take suddenly went into someone being 
consoling and compassionate. The leadership principle that accompanies this is that leaders have a say and give others a say in how situations occur. So that's quite incredible, actually, when we start to think about this in a business, that you, as a leader, have a say in how situations occur and how situations occur to others. And you give other people the means for them to change the way that they're looking at something. You give them the means to change paradigms. And we'll often talk at Business of Architecture, well, how can you, how can you do this? And I think really, you know, if you start listening to your team members as leaders, number one, that changes a lot of things, okay? You're starting to listen for their ability as a leader rather than listening to them as someone who can't do something, okay? Or someone who is struggling or someone who is um, smaller, okay? We're listening for their leadership. We're listening for their greatness, Okay. And developing a business that actually as part of your culture has a, an element of coaching, an environment of coaching and support and performance, I think can be very, very powerful. We often talk about um, a number of different leadership languages from first of all, being very directive or the delegation type of language, which is you speak to somebody, you give them a result that you want, you don't care how they do it, but you expect them to go off and do it. We do that a lot as business owners, and often it's quite ineffective because we're expecting either too much from somebody or we haven't gone through the process of the other leadership languages in order for them to be the right person to be able to do that kind of job. Other teams, you might have had this experience with your your own team, which is quite the opposite, where you lift an eyebrow um, and they know what that lifting of the eyebrow means and they've already gone and prepared the report or they've already brought that piece of information up for you and you look at them and then they go, here you go, this is what you needed and you're like, wow, okay, great. That's a kind of level of complicity or flow, if you like, that we could have in a high performance team. That's well, that's the kind of where we want to be going. But this idea of the leadership languages, we're talking about delegation, being very directive with somebody, um, you know, just giving them the answer. But there's the next one, which is actually a much more handholding um, and a kind of um, showing somebody how something is done step by step. Okay, so you give them his number one, here's step number two, here's step number three, here's step number four. And you actually do it with them, for them, you show them, bang, bang, bang. Then we move on to the second language of, of leadership, which might be coaching, which is now you're allowing them to do things by themselves and you're there to motivate and inspire. And also you're allowing them to make their own mistakes. Okay. Third is a more supportive and listening. And then fourth, we're in the language of delegation. Okay. So you as a leader have a say and give others a say in how situations occur. Okay. So you're empowering people to be able to change the way that events are occurring for them. Okay. So you're able to shift paradigms. You're able to use language and communicate in a way where you're able to expand somebody's viewpoint. You're able to change the context with which they're operating in. it. Takes a lot of skill, but it's very, very pertinent and powerful. Number two, the second law of performance is how a situation occurs arises in language. And the leadership principle that accompanies that is leaders must master the conversational environment. So how a situation occurs arises in language. Now, we could have a, a longer philosophical debate about what is a language, and there might be musical language, mathematical language, um, but let's just focus it on the domain of verbal language because that's very easy for us to understand and it's also very useful because immediately we know now the power of our words and that actually everybody has some kind of mastery of language otherwise you wouldn't be able to be able to interact with them and certainly in your own organization 
and that by changing the language, the words that they are using to describe a situation gives us an access point into changing how an event or circumstances are occurring. This is massively, it's so simple, but it's also incredibly profound when we start to, to recognize that just by the language that we're using, we can change our whole concept of reality. There's another great book that um, we'll often get people to read called um, What to Say When You Speak to Yourself by a guy called Dr. Shad Helmsetter. And this is a fabulous book that gives lots of very practical ways of being able to reprogram your mind and actually to become aware of the habitual thinking patterns that are existing that describe and color your everyday experience that have a result, that have an impact on the way that you're behaving, interacting and performing. Um, and a lot of us might not even think that the way that we're thinking or the language that we're using internally is having an impact but for other people, other people will often recognize it in you, even though we might find it quite difficult for ourselves. So actually getting into a discipline where you start to become cognizant of the internal narrative that you have that's describing everything can be incredibly, incredibly powerful. And recognizing that it's language that is the the access point to it. Okay, so we, we could start to look at that everything actually exists inside of the realm of something linguistic. Okay, that's how human beings, that's how we conceptualize um, primarily is something linguistic, something, something language based. And we have the ability to manipulate and change language at a very deep level which means that we can literally change the way that reality is occurring for us. We can, when it gets really powerful is when we start changing the language that we're using even to describe ourselves. Now, it's not as straightforward as this. I'm suddenly going to think, uh, you know, and I'm just going to describe something in a new way because it, it kind of works on a series of levels where there's a kind of conscious surface level of language that's being used to describe something. And then there's often deeper levels which are obscured from us, okay? So there's actually hidden language or hidden beliefs that we're not consciously aware of, okay? That in many cases don't even make any logical sense, okay? But we're, that's, what they're, that's the kind of underpinning programming that's, that's working. So again, a business of architecture, we go into a lot of... Um, psychology, if you like, about uncovering these kind of hidden beliefs uh, and hidden mindsets. I think a good example is around money uh, for, for, for sure. And, you know, we often find many architects and clients, we've been brainwashed, if you like, um, either through family or through university, where we've become kind of very apathetic to money or we think of profit as being evil we think of money as being a nasty um nasty thing or we have a belief that all rich people are scumbags and the only way to um to to develop wealth is through doing something unscrupulous when those kinds of hidden beliefs are at play okay they will make it very difficult to be successful in business or in that particular domain. Okay. There's a kind of tension point. There's a, there is a, a stress, if you like, there's a kind of trying to operate with the, with the handbrake on. Um, and, and, and that can be very difficult, but to, to actually kind of do a little bit of inner work and to recognize that that's the subjective model that we're using to understand it, first of all, in language, or what are the sorts of things that I'm saying to myself to start to identify them, and then to start to unpick them, actually question them, and actually kind of undermine them, if you like, start to strip them back and replace them with something new. So we're interested in language, we're interested in the words that we use, and leaders of a business master the conversational environment. So they become good at being able to 
propagate certain types of conversations in their business, which are very productive and are high performance conversations. I'll often go back to the values that you have in a business. Um, and actually, when we look at a business, all there really is, is a series of conversations that are happening in the organization at any time. So I might go into a business and there's a business, there's a business that's filled with conversations that are complaint based. Okay. And when there's business filled with complaint based conversations, there's not much possibility. There's not much hope. Even if the, um, the, the leaders of the business suddenly come up with this fantastic new vision and direction for the company, it's undermined by a culture of complaint, mediocrity, and there hasn't been anything to do to restore the integrity or to get complete with the past and the past conversations that used to exist. Okay. This is where values of a business become very, very useful because your values are essentially kind of guiding principles, if you like, for the business to be um, following. And the values inside of a business are really, they're only really going to exist in conversations and conversations which lead to actions being taken. So we want to have businesses where the, the values that we say that we're living are actually being spoken into existence and that actions are being born out of those conversations that people have um, in the organization. I remember working, uh, I've worked at businesses where there's been a complaint culture and I've worked at businesses where there has been very clear principles and values that meant that the people who work there have just feeling of respect. And the conversational environment in that organization was worlds apart from the business that had an environment of complaint. Okay. Just think about it as well. The conversational environment also, it underpins all of your marketing, your messaging. It attracts a certain kind of person who has already got that kind of conversation and belief system um, operating in their own mind. Okay. So the conversational environment, very, very profound. Okay. It might sound very simplistic of how I'm describing it, but I can't, uh, I can't stress how deeply pertinent and poignant, uh, this, these ideas are. Okay. The third law of performance is that future based language transforms how situations occur to people and the leadership corollary or principle, cause I'm struggling to say that word, um, is that leaders listen for the future of their organization. Okay, so this is very interesting, is that the future that you're living into, the future that you're living into is what gives you right now. Okay, the future that you're living into is what gives you as, as a human being. It's what's giving the current conversation. It is dictating your level of performance. Okay, so having a clear vision for the organization and the future that the business is going into is moving towards is something that drives performance. Okay, so as a leader, you must become somebody who's listening for the future of the organization. Okay, and listening for the future of the organization is different from, say, going off with a whole load of consultants and coming up with a vision and saying, here's where we're going. Okay. There's part of it that, that, that might exist like that, but actually listening to, well, what's the future of the people here? What are they, what are they having a say in? What do they believe? What do they want? What's important to them? Okay. And I think this is really where good leaders separate themselves from poor leaders or bosses is that good leaders have a very intimate understanding of what their team members want what's important to their team members, where do they want to go? And that team members, it's not that they buy into the vision of the company, but at a very deep level, they recognize that the goals and the things that are super important for them can be realized by them realizing the goal of the organization and that the goal in their, of the organization is deeply um, influenced or in alignment with their own personal values. Okay, so future based language is starts to, is the thing that starts to give us direction. Now, we can't just generate future based language without dealing with the past. And in many cases, it looks like the past is actually giving us our future. And this is where we kind of get into what we call a default future. 
which is a future which just looks like the past. It's very predictable. It's filled with the same mediocre results that we've always had. And often what happens is that our past isn't in the past at all. It's actually filed out into the future. We've made a decision about something or somebody, and we're just playing that past decision out into the future again and again and again. I'll give you an example. Imagine that you're, you know, some of you might have been at secondary school and you're all lined up to play football and there are two captains and they're picking teams. And lo and behold, you get picked last. And at that moment, you make a decision in your mind, oh, I suck at football. Oh, I hate sports. Oh, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do this anymore. Okay. And at that moment, you start to withdraw from playing team games. Now, some of you might have a very, might have had a much more positive uh, response to it. And the same thing is true. Okay. But here we're more interested in, in past results or past decisions that are giving rise to poor performance. Okay. So you get picked last, make a decision about your relationship to sports. You now file that decision out into the future and you keep playing it again and again and again. I'll give you another example of how the past uh, or how the future is giving you who you are right now. Let's imagine I'm an architect. I'm in my office. It's um, Friday evening. I'm in a cold, gloomy London. I've got 100 and, you know, I've got 150 emails uh, in my in my inbox, there's clients who want things, there's contractors who need stuff, there's drawings that need to be done. But I'm super excited because tomorrow, Saturday, I'm on vacation and I'm flying to one of my favorite cities. I'm flying out to Florence with my, with my wife and we're going to enjoy uh, coffee and Negronis for the whole weekend whilst indulging in lots of fine art and highbrow cultural activities. Okay, so the future that I'm living into is giving me who I am in the present. Let's fast forward to the end of that weekend. Okay, we're sitting in this beautiful hidden Florentine piazza, sipping on Negroni and coffee, and I see a plane flying over my head, and it's a, you know, it's a cheap Ryanair flight, and suddenly I had that pang of dread because I know that tomorrow I've got to get on that crappy flight, fly back to London, and fly back to the, the desk with all the drawings and all the unread emails, okay? So the future now starts to give me who I am right now, okay? So this is how human beings operate. The future that we're creating, the future that we're living into is what's giving us um, who we are and our levels of performance now, all right? So future-based language becomes something that, we become, that we're super interested in, in mastering, in speaking, um, and listening for, and this can radically transform the current performance of any organization. I'll leave it there. Um, go and get yourself a copy of this book, um, at business of architecture. We discussed this book and many others on our smart practice program. Um, as we walk businesses through, um, business transformation to create new futures for unprecedented results. Been great speaking to you. I'll talk again shortly and that's a wrap and one more thing if you haven't already please do head on over to itunes or spotify and leave us a review we'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already this episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.